So Isabel, thank you so much for joining me today. I'm really excited to, to talk about this subject we're going to dive into today around ISO 2022. Um, and I'm really glad um, that, that we've got you on because I think that there's kind of this common misconception in the payments industry that everybody knows everything about everything. So I kind of wanted to take a look at ISO 2022 and kind of take a look at it a little bit from a Payments 101 uh, perspective here. So first, let's start off our conversation here today with a definition of what is ISO 2022? Sure. And so in, at its most basic level, um, ISO 2022 is a global message standard that can be used for all types of financial communication. And the interesting thing about it is that it's independent of the parties, the counterparties that use it, be it banks, market infrastructure, uh, corporates, for example. It's independent of the business domain in the financial space. So it could be payment, securities, treasury, et cetera. And it's also independent of the network uh, that, that uses the standard. So that's, I would say, the first thing. Um, the second element, uh, just, just as a, a little piece of reference, um, ISO stands for International Standards Organization, and the standard is registered and published there. So in case people wonder, uh, you can go to that website and you find lots of information about, about ISO. Now, if we, if we go to the next level of depth. Um, when people hear standard, they typically just think about message and a message description. But ISO 2022 gives us more than that. Um, and it really starts, uh, or it really is, a comprehensive representation of the business model um, in the financial services space, right? Um, so the business model defines who are the actors? What are their roles and responsibilities? What information do these actors need to exchange? Um, it defines then from their singular business components and elements in that ecosystem, right? So it's kind of a dictionary, a, a business dictionary, if you want. That's kind of the most fundamental layer and important layer of, uh, of what ISO gives us. The, the second element is from there, what the standard does, it creates logical messages that support the business processes in in this uh, in this ecosystem right and and that is that is typically what we think of right we think of the different message types for example a, a credit transfer um you know how that that is you know what, what comes to mind when people think about iso 20 or 22. but with that that's just I, i'd say the second layer is merely a logical structure of uh, of these messages and then the third component is um, the physical representation of, of the message and how it's being used in, in our technologies. Uh, and it's kind of the, the, the syntax. And for, for ISO 2022, uh, the most commonly used syntax is XML. So, so a lot of people will, will kind of say, oh, ISO 2022, that's not XML message, uh, which is true at the moment because that's how we use it, but it's not it is not a necessity. So, so the, the core components in terms of the business model as well as the logical messages could be used with a different syntax at some point in the future, right? If our technology changes and something better come, than XML comes up, we could actually easily change and switch to, 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 uh, to a different types of syntax. Um, so that's, that's in its core what ISO 2022 is. And, and maybe just a, a, a quick uh, uh, comment on one of the reasons why we're talking so much about it at the moment in the payment industry is because a lot of the, the, the major high value payment uh, market infrastructures are actually moving to and adopting to this, uh, the, this standard. So there's a lot of work going on. Yeah, no, I, I certainly agree. I think, you know, to, to speak to that in terms of just some of the organizations that are using it, I know that uh, the Fed, the Federal Reserve recently came out and kind of said, hey, look, yes, we, we, we are heavily looking at ISO 2022 for Fed now, um, which is their real-time rails that that they're looking to implement uh, within a couple of years. So, so it is kind of becoming the the main standard system that organizations are looking towards going to. Um, so, I mean, it kind of begs the question then in terms of why, and I think we can get to that in a little bit. But I'm curious to get now, kind of what does the current kind of messaging system look like for payments? Because it's, it's something that we use, but why are we switching away from 
that. So let's get a little bit better of an understanding of what that current messaging system kind of looks like today and why a, an upgrade is, is kind of in the near future. Yeah, and, and uh, it's, we, could, we could actually spend an hour on just that question, right? <laughs> because uh, uh, the, 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 the fundamental kind of um, current environment is, is a patchwork. So in the cross-border payment space, the network and system that's most widely known and will come to mind is obviously SWIFT and the SWIFT FIN network, uh, right? Web bank exchange payment messages. Uh, cross-border payment messages. And SWIFT uses the so-called MT message type messages, uh, which is what, what you know, everybody who does cross-border payments is very familiar with. They've been around for 40 years uh, and we all love them. And as a matter of fact, um, SWIFT MT messages are, and SWIFT as a network is used, for example, for, by some market infrastructures such as, you know, Target 2, EBA, CHAPS, uh, so in, in Europe for Euros and, and GPP, but, but many others as well, right? But it's not the only one. So if we just stay with the high value payment clearing systems in the US, for example, Chips and Fedwire have their own proprietary standards. The low value or ACH payment systems in various countries have a different standard yet again. So, so what, we, what we truly have is cross-border has Swift MT, but in, in many other places, when we think about payments, there, there are a lot of very different standards, which all eventually try to do the same thing, but they are not the same. Yeah, I, I think that, that that's really important to kind of point out because it really is kind of a bit of a, a, a programmer's headache, right? Because it's kind of if, I mean, I, I do a little bit of, uh, of programming on my end and you're kind of almost creating this switch use case here where you say, okay, well, if it's got to go that direction, I have to kind of plug into that system and know what how how exactly it is that that whole messaging system works. So I've got to program it for that. And then, oh, well, that's just one geographic location or one type of messaging system. Well, there's a whole bunch of others. So from a programming standpoint, you're kind of like, well, it'd be fantastic if there was just one simple, hey, everybody uses this standard. So everybody programs to it. So you know, kind of as you're going in and you see all this innovation going on that the innovation becomes quicker yeah. because you don't have to think about all these other variables that exist throughout the globe, you just have one thing. It's kind of, you know, like programming for an API. You have the documentation, you know, okay, I've, I've got to make this particular call for this particular piece of data, as opposed to right now it's a, well, I've got to make this call for that geographic location, that one for that one, and it becomes a bit of a nightmare. So beyond that aspect of it, why is it really important that payment, the payments industry needs to adopt ISO 20022? Yeah. So, I, I mean, I think that's a big one, right? Uh, so when I, when I think about, you know, why are we going through this massive effort? Because it is that transformation is going to be uh, uh, material in terms of the, the, the amount of work, right? Uh, three things. One, process automation. Two, what you just mentioned, which is interoperability, right? Which is essential. Mm -hmm. And three, as a result of enhancement in that space, client experience, right? Yeah. If you think about payments, Nobody wakes up in the morning and says, oh, I want to make a payment today because it's fun to make a payment, right? Payments, we, not, we don't make payments for the sake of making payment. A payment is always facilitating some other type of transaction between two parties. The goal of these two parties is complete the transaction, not to complete the payment, right? In our current ecosystem, the payment networks and processes, they don't operate seamlessly. I mean, you just described it, right, in your, in your, in your, in your own word and your own experience, but that is truly where we, where we live. Um, so, so payment networks don't necessarily integrate well, but also they don't integrate well with business processes that they support, right? We are in a world where digitization is basically the name of the game, right? Everything that we do is, is expected to be, to be fast and seamless so that we can focus or the, the end users can really focus on the transaction they're trying to complete, not on moving money from, from A to B, right? And, and that's why it is so important to, for, for us to actually get to that point uh, of using a standard that allows interoperability, using a standard that clearly defines 
um, this business model, right, that is very structured and very granular in, in its setup so that it can, it can support automation of processes that today are still to a large extent manual or where things kind of fall out of an STP process because the, the standard itself, the description of the data that is carried across the networks isn't sufficiently um, granular. Yeah, no, I, 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 you know, I completely agree there. And I think, you know, I, I think the industry as a whole is in agreement that, hey, we do need to migrate over to this new standard here. But it's not as simple as just flipping the switch and saying, all right, everybody, everybody's going to be on this starting yeah. tomorrow. <laughs> Let's go with it. So what what are those challenges that the industry needs to kind of get across so that way then there is the adoption across the globe of this standard? Yeah. Um, so again, the challenges that I think we have ahead of us in the next three, four or five years, uh, I like to think in threes, right? So three again, data, again, interoperability and people. Um, so the, the reason I start with data is because uh, in, in the end, I just, I just kind of closed your, your, the answer to, to your previous question with, you know, it's all about having this wonderful data, right? Well, we don't have it necessarily today, right? So banks, as well as their end clients, must now prepare the transition to being ready to actually source, store, and process data that is a lot more structured and granular than what we have today, right? So what that actually means is we need to make changes to not just our payment and financial messaging platforms, because that's, that's logical, right? If you change something related to your payment, your payment system is must change. But it's bigger than that. We need to think about the full life cycle of a transaction end to end. And that means we have to start thinking about what does our customer and counterparty data look like? How is it structured? How is it represented in our data repositories? What are the processes that we have in place to collect it from our counterparties, right? How do our risk systems use this data? How do our accounting systems use this data? Um, for banks, how do we represent it in our electronic banking systems? How do we report it to our clients, right? So, so this, this nirvana that, <laughs> or, or the piece that is going to get us to the nirvana, right, is going to require a lot of work in, uh, in our infrastructures and in our processes. So that's kind of the first thing that is going to be a, a, a real challenge. Second component um, is, again, a nirvana of interoperability. It will take us time to get there, right? The, the, the global rollout at the moment plan, at the moment in the cross-border space, runs from, 20, from 2022 to 2025, roughly, right? This is where some of the major systems will be migrating to ISO, but they are not all migrating at the same time. Right? So what it means, we will have a swift network and major clearing systems that are still using different, uh, different types of, um, of, of, of standards. And you could argue, well, we have this today, what's the big deal? The big deal is, again, it goes back to data. So if you have part of the industry that's moving to richer, more structured data, but the rest of the industry is not ready, how do you deal with that funneling process that you need to do. Where does data drop, right? And can we afford to drop data? Um, if, it's, if it's information that's relevant uh, for, for the end parties, well, maybe it's not a good idea to drop it. And maybe if it's information that's relevant to our risk management processes, you want to be able to somehow cater for it. Um, but that, that really, that period of, of coexistence, which is what it's called, generally referred to between, between you know, 2022 and 2025, is going to be challenging in that respect um, because we have some actors and infrastructures that deal with a lot of data already and others don't. And, and we, we have to find a way. Now, there's a lot of work that's being done in the industry. SWIFT is, is, is uh, kind of sharpening their thinking in that as are some of the other, the other clearing systems and, and obviously the, the banks as well. But it is going to be um, it is going to be complex. A small additional piece, I would say, even once we have reached our end state, it is important to also ensure that while we will all these infrastructures will be using ISO 20 or 22 as their standard, they could use it differently, right? So. Um, 
there has been a lot of work in the industry across market infrastructure operators to create an alignment uh, around which pieces of this gigantic message are going to be relevant and going to be used in their schemes and make sure that their schemes remain aligned. So that, that awareness is there in the industry, but we need to also make sure it's our collective responsibility to make sure that what we build and is nicely integrated at first remains as such. Right. And then quickly, people, the last piece, um, we, we, uh, anybody who does cross-border payments has grown up with the, the Swift MT messages, which I referenced earlier, right? So we love them. They're nice. They're simple. They're easy to understand. Well, if you look at a PAX message, which is the ISO equivalent for, for the payment messages between banks, it actually is not that simple to read and, and, and understand, right? Um, However, it kind of spans multiple pages if you, if you print out the whole message description. Uh, however, we need to make sure that in a first step, the people who actually do the transformation process understand this, but more, more uh, importantly, in the longer run, everybody in our businesses that supports uh, you know, the BAU environment of payments understands that as well. So there's a massive training effort across our populations that, um, quite frankly, I don't think as an industry we have fully grasped yet. Uh, it's, it's enormous um, and uh, time, is, time is short. Um, and, and so we'll, we'll have to collectively think about, about how we tackle that as well. Yeah, I, you know, I, I'm really glad that you brought up kind of that that nirvana moment, right, where, you know, everybody is on this new standard and you have all of this data um, and being able to collect all this data. Because one of the things that I, I really picked up on and what you were saying is just how the different departments use that data. Because I think one of the things that, that we talk about a lot in the payments industry is breaking down the data silos that are there. And I kind of see that as really kind of a, a huge opportunity of ISO 20022. But I'm curious to get kind of your thoughts. And I know we've talked about this a little bit, but what are what are really those, those core benefits that if I'm kind of sitting there and I'm in the payments industry and I'm like, yeah, I know I've got to do this, but I'm kind of grumbling about it like what, what's the selling point to make me go like you know what nope that's exactly I, i've got to do it today i've got to start my process of, of migrating over other than the fact that i'm going to need to but like this gets me excited to adopt this new standard yeah yeah so i mean in in the end uh you know when we, we run business for our clients right so so why are we doing all of this we're doing all of this you know in its most basic form because it allows for a seamless client experience for our customers where payments are embedded in the business processes that they support that kind of sounds fancy right so trancing translating that to kind of okay what, what specifically are we talking about here right Again, data, data uh, structured, more robust data supports um, better straight through processing STP. It supports automatic reconciliation processes. It supports, therefore, increased payment speed and reduced cost. Right. So that that's kind of one set of things that I think are really key, and we can we can maybe dig into those a little bit. Second component, we talked about interoperability, right? Interoperability of these networks allows a payment to travel more easily across networks, across the globe, across payment rails, right? Better global reachability. So at the moment, a payment ecosystem, if you look at all the payment systems in the world, is fragmented, right? Here, we actually create a lot, uh, an opportunity to, to, to bridge that fragmentation, right? And that was your description earlier around, you know, how do I need to do all these translations? Well, all that pain goes away, right? So we have a much, much better reachability for, for payments. And quite frankly, our payment ecosystem is in flux, right? So there, there um, with the emergence of instant payment system, which you referenced as well, right? Um, there's a lot happening in that space. So by ensuring that we all talk the same language, we can, we can ensure that all of this new stuff that's happening remains connected and we can make sense of it, right? Um, and then I would say the, the, the last element as well is by taking out the effort that we currently have to spend on translations, on conversions, on manual efforts, uh, on manual reconciliation, et cetera, that allows everybody, every actor in the payment chain to actually focus on value added activities, right? On 
data-driven services on maybe better liquidity forecasting, better risk modeling, et cetera, right? So this is, to me, that is actually almost the biggest opportunity is removing all of the friction from the process today and taking the energy and the investment that we put into solving those at the moment into things that are, that are new and that allow us to add new value to, to our clients and to our businesses. It's quite exciting. Yeah, no, I, I certainly agree with it. With it is quite exciting. You know, w one of the things that I kind of a, a little bit relate it to is that I, I one, I think it's 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 interesting that I mean we keep bringing up data, you know, throughout this a conversation here and the importance of it. And I think that that's a, a, a bit interesting because I kind of feel that this standardization has really come to to pass or kind of that that people have come to acknowledge this when they kind of go that the payment is kind of become or the, the data itself is becoming just almost as important as the payment itself. And and I think that that's interesting because I kind of relate it to, you know, the the internet itself. You know, they they took a long time but they eventually adopted HTTP protocol and they said, "Okay, everybody is going to be this is the language that we're all going to use to be able to to send information across in this manner." And that's kind of the same thing I, I look at anyways, as I kind of relate it in my brain of what's going on in the payments industry is they say, hey, we've got this next important part of this whole payment process here, which is the data. So we need to make sure that everybody's on the same page in yeah. terms of how that data is going to be communicated with each other um, yeah. for it. And then as you pointed out there, and rightfully so, that once, once that standard communication happens, you don't really need to concern yourself with that. You don't need to worry about, okay, did this, did the correct message get across because of these different locations? You're, you're not really concerned with that. You're more concerned about, okay, now I know that the payment is going to get delivered. What additional value add can I put on top of this? So that way then it just increases the value of the, the transition of from point A to point B with that payment in data. And then also, okay, how do I use that additional data for that added value? Um, so with, with that in mind and kind of that keeping that in mind, what are some of kind of the current use cases that you're seeing in the marketplace um, that are utilizing this new payment standard? Um, yeah, so, so maybe just I, I'll, I'll take a little, little detour on uh, um, before I kind of specifically respond to that. I'm just giving an example where I really think that having that extra data creates the value, just, just having it, right, creates value for clients at the end point, right? So in, um, in the ISO standard, we have enhanced remittance data information or remittance data fields, right, that go much beyond what is in the current SWIFT MT, um, you know, six lines of free format text, right? Rich and structured remittance data allows the receiver of a payment much better to automatically reconcile the funds received, assign it to an a counterparty, reduce the sales outstanding, and create capacity for new sales. As simple as that, right? And it sounds very simple. But with that, you know, by, by leveraging what the standard uh, allows me to do, I provide my client with the ability to actually grow their business. That's pretty powerful in itself, right? I mean, if we didn't, if, 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 if nothing else, that should actually motivate us to, you know, to, to start moving on this. Um, but uh, I think maybe a, a specific, specific live example where, where using, uh, using the ISO standard, we actually see uh, uh, really some of, these, uh, some of these benefits realized is in the, uh, the real-time payment space in the, in the US. So you mentioned FedNow, but we actually have a live uh, RTP instant payment system, which is operated by the clearinghouse. Um, and RTP uses the ISO 20 or 22 standards. Um, RTP has some unique features such as what's called a request to pay. So it's an ask to be paid, right? And that business process uses actually multiple messages that are exchanged between multiple parties in that chain, right? From the, from, from the debtor who's actually requesting a payment through multiple banks, the market infrastructure and the creditor, and it goes back and forth, right? All of this is in the ISO standard, right? Yet, it can, the, the end result, uh, kind of basically using that standard, allows us to do all of this back and forth in a fully automated pay way, embedded in the underlying business processes of the end points, and in seconds. That's fantastic. 
right? I mean, we would have tried to do this 10 years ago, we wouldn't have been able, right? But this is, this is what kind of some of the, some of the benefits uh, of, of using a robust standard like that uh, will, will deliver to us. And it's live. Yeah, yeah, I, th I think that that's one, one of the one of the great things about it is that it's it's not something that we're sitting here and talking about and saying like, oh, well, this is this is a future because I mean, it, it is to some extent in the terms of just a like a, the, the full adoption of it, but it's it's already being used. It's not as though, okay, we have to wait for everybody to get it. And we're like, all right, we've got a hundred percent adoption of ISO 2020-022. We can start to take advantage. No, you, you can start to take advantage of that now. And I think that's what's really fantastic about it is, is it's not limited. Yes, there is still kind of that, that we're at the, not the uh, uh, Nirvana moment, but we're kind of in that little bit of a go-between where it's like, okay, there are still different messaging systems, but we're getting closer and closer to that deadline there. And as we do, you would have to make the assumption that more and more organizations start to adopt uh, the, the new messaging standard uh, here. Um, so Isabel, thank you so much for taking the time today for explaining uh, to me and my audience of ISO 20022. And I hope to have you back on this video real soon. Thank you very much, Ryan. It was my pleasure. Thank you.